payasos. sing I Must Tell Jesus and I'll give you a nickel if you know where it is. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You're always clowning around. 356. <laughs> Let's stand. We'll sing. You're going to have to sing really loud because a lot of people haven't shown up quite yet. I Must Tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear my burden alone. In my distress, He kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for His own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Verse 3, tempted and tried, I need a great Savior, one who can help my burden to bear. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, he all my cares and sorrows will share. I must tell Jesus, Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus, bear my burden alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Oh, how the world to evil allures me. Oh, how my heart is tempted to sin. I must tell Jesus, and he will help me over the world, the victory to win. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me. Jesus alone. Oh, that's fine singing. Well, sometimes we do have burdens, and we just get to a place where we, we just can't bear them. We can't handle it anymore. We've had all we can stand, and we think we're going to fall apart. We think our head's going to explode, and the only thing we have to really do is go get alone and get serious with the Lord and start pouring our heart out to Him. And He hears, and He blesses, and He helps us. I'm dealing with several different people right now. It's, it's kind of like the, I don't know, the counseling gate's been kicked wide open. And uh, dealing with a lot of people, and, and they're right to that place where, man, they just can't take another one more thing. And it's always, let's go back, let's talk to Jesus about this, let's get this thing straight. All right, well, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get going. Now, Father in heaven, we sure love you. We thank you for your mercy and your goodness and your grace. We thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. Thank you for America and our freedoms. Thank you for our president, our vice president, our, our senate and our congress. Lord, we pray for them. We ask, oh God, that you allow us to, to live a quiet and peaceable life. I hear that in Seattle they've got a police-free zone now. They've uh, they've conquered a hill or whatever, and they've they've taken it over. The Antifa, the fascist group, the haters of democracy, the the ones who are anarchists, the ones destroying everything. They don't have a plan for building anything, making anything better. They just want to tear down and destroy, and they want to bring in Marxist ideology. They're just having such a big time. I hear where the uh, the folks in Minneapolis are trying to figure out how they can defund their police department. Well, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Just go ahead and defund the thing and let the people run wild. And Lord Jesus, that's happening all around. And I pray, God, that you'd please bless our leadership in this country. I pray, Father, that you'd give us, restore some kind of sensibility to them, give them some common sense, and get them to do right and help them to walk right, help them to be right, and help them to think right. 
Lord God, these governors are allowing this foolishness to go on. They need to be spanked severely by you. I pray, God, you'd bring that to them. And, Father, these uh, men and women who know better and could, should stand better, I pray that you'd please break their hearts for righteousness. I pray that they'd see the foolishness and the folly of what they're doing and what they're allowing to go on in this country. Lord, we've allowed this thing to go on for so long. It's not even funny. We, we kicked you out of the schoolhouse. We kicked you out of the courthouse. We kicked you out of the state house. But thank God we, uh, we've allowed you back in the White House for a little while. And I pray, God, you would bless us. I pray that you'd help us. And I pray that you'd work in our lives in a mighty and a powerful way. I ask, God, that you'd allow, allow us to, uh, since we do have this freedom, I pray we'd exploit our freedom. Just as the, the fascists are, I pray we'd exploit it for your sake. I pray we'd take the time to witness. Uh, Christians have stopped witnessing. They've stopped going. They've stopped telling. Because it's kind of an inconvenience, kind of a hard thing. But, Lord God, the day's going to come when we won't be able to go. They'll say, no, it's illegal. God, I pray that you'd help us. I pray that you'd protect us from that. And I pray that you'd help us to defend our privileges and liberties. And, and I pray that you'd bless this whole country. God, have mercy on our churches. I pray that you'd help the, the preachers to preach right. I pray that the people live right. And I pray that you'd bring honor and glory to thy name. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, hang on just a second. I forgot that I'm leading music today. We've got all sorts of people out. And uh, so it's, you're stuck with me, unless God wants to come up and leave music. I haven't seen anybody jumping up and charging the pulpit yet. Okay, let's tell, go over to 232. Tell me the story of Jesus. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Just sing out. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word Tell me the story most precious Sweetest that ever was heard Tell how the angels in chorus Sang as they welcomed his birth Glory to God in the highest Peace and good tidings on earth. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. How, uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, tell me when, when was the first time you heard the story of Jesus' his saving power? When was that? Can you put your finger on that and think back that far? First time. Yes, ma'am. 1984. Somebody told you the story. Anybody else can remember that far back? Yes, sir. 1991. Praise the Lord. Somebody else. Yes, ma'am. Well, amen. Good. Did you have a specific day when you trusted Christ? Okay, I was going to say, you, you can't be a Christian all your life. You've got to start somewhere. I was thinking maybe he's trying to trick us. Yeah, I know. I've been in that church where you were. I said, I've been in that church where you were. And they're just now finishing the repairs. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody else? Remember? Yes, ma'am. Miss Daphne. 89. Yes, ma'am. Well, amen. Praise the Lord. Fred Brown. I know that name somehow. I've heard him from, from somewhere. Okay, yeah. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Super good. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Praise the Lord. Tell me that story of Jesus. Amen. All right, let's sing verse number two. Feeling. Oh, I'm sorry. Start that again. I got to be able to read plus C. I'm sorry. Fasting alone in the desert. Tell of the days that are past. For our sins he was tempted, yet was triumphant at last. Tell of the years of his labor, tell of the sorrow he bore. He was
was despised and afflicted, homeless, rejected, and poor. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him. Tell how he liveth again. Love in that story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Stay, let me weep while you whisper. Love paid the ransom for me. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story so precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Amen. Well, glad to see you tonight. Glad you hear a couple announcements to be made. We've got things rolling along around here. Uh, Burl and uh, the family and all, all the people have all the, the uh, details worked out for the the uh, overnight trip to the wilderness of Darlington in Montgomery County. And uh, the kids are going to have a ball. They're going to leave here at 5 o'clock on Friday, be back at 10 uh, the next morning. They're going to capture food, capture the frogs, capture the message, capture the flag and capture the mess. They're going to clean up after themselves. So uh, we went out shopping today for food. They are going to eat. It's going to look, looks like it's going to be pretty good. And so we're excited about that for them. And then we're working out uh, details for camp. We've got to get the camp date set. I think it's already set. Uh, I think it's it's, I think it's the next last week in, in July, I think. But we've got the place set. And uh, now we're just going to work out all the more details on it. So it's kind of this... Uh, restrictions they put on us has really kind of messed up things and camp has always been the big thing for the year and we're, we're uh, coming up like Taylor and Charlie here we're, we're at the very back of things trying to get get caught up but you be praying for us and we'll get this thing squared away well, I'm looking forward to camp I, that is my favorite week of the entire year without a doubt and it's sometimes it's the most uh, uh, stressful but it's always been the greatest uh, week of the year God does great things in our camp and we're looking forward to it again this year uh, coming up Sunday night, the 21st, uh, it's our uh, Sunday night sing night. I'd like you to sign up and I'd like you to do a special. And uh, just a couple uh, hundred specials would be great. We'll just have a good old fashioned sing. Then after the service that night, we're going to have an outside fellowship. I want you to be here for that. Bring a covered dish of some kind and we'll have a good time. It's been a long time since we had any real fellowships and we're going to get that going again. Looking forward to it. And we're probably going to have a little bit of popcorn preaching. I'm going to tag some guys and give them three or four minutes to preach, five minutes or six minutes to preach. And it's such a piece of cake for them. Uh, they just, it's, it's easy, isn't it, Brother Wayne? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, right. Okay, super good. So we're going to have a good time. So plan on being here on the 21st, and that will be a good, good time. And I think that is all the announcements I have for this evening. I hope I'm not missing anything else. And so let's go ahead and stand one more time. We're going to sing. Let's go over here to page 65, just over in the glory land. We're going to sing the first, third, and the fourth. We'll just sing out. Just over in the glory land. 
sheets out and we'll look those over real quick. I have something I want to add to it real quickly here. Just a moment. Our missionary of the week. I got some things to share on this. Um, is the Stillwaters Christian boarding school in glorious, beautiful Union, Mississippi. Actually, it's not in Union, Mississippi. It's in somewhere else. It's in, in between Union and Philadelphia. But we got some good things going on. The Union's got a got a little bit of a history to it. And uh, uh, during the Civil War, Lisa Seth Grant was down in there, and he camped there in Union, Mississippi, and he did not have it burned when he left. And they left. A, they put up a big plaque by by this house where he stayed, and it's still standing. And it talks about the, that part of the Civil War and everything. And it's it's interesting. It's not the most uh, well cared for thing. Yes, sir. Yes, the, you got. If you need something down there, you got to take it with you when you go because they don't have it. But anyhow, they uh, uh, it's just it's kind of a nice little thing to run, nice town to run through. There's a lot of history down there, a lot, a lot of southern history down there. It's really interesting. But one of the greatest things that ever happened in that area is the Christian homeless down there uh, in the uh, I want to say in the 90s, early 90s. Brother Palmer and Miss Miss Kay Palmer and, and Ray Palmer went down there, and moved their children's home from uh, Corpus Christi, Texas, over to uh, Union, Mississippi, and then uh, a lot of good things have been going on. Now that it's not a girl's home, now it's a boy's home. We have another facility that's closed because we don't have anybody to, to work in it. But anyhow, the boy's home is hitting on all cylinders all of a sudden. Uh, we had someone uh, donate a cow, which was very handy. Came in at, uh, I think, is 800 pounds of uh, beef for the freezer. And then uh, we've got uh, a new boy came in last week. Got another boy coming in on the 6th. And we've got another boy coming in on two weeks after that, and another. We've got three more, three to five other boys that they're, they're looking at right now. And I think what it is is all these kids have been home, and the parents have been locked up with them at home for this thing, and the children are driving them crazy, so they're sending them off to, to Mississippi. And so we're excited to get them. Um, see, I want to, there's a couple things I want to share with you. We we are having we've got a little bit of a court battle going on, but the Lord has given us some. Grace on that. We had some kids run away, and then their, their, uh, the parents have signed uh, paperwork and everything on regarding all this. But you know, when something happens and a lawyer gets involved, they just try to uh, forget about the paperwork and go around. Anyhow, anyhow, our insurance company called us and, and told us that they they realized that we are in better position than we they thought that that we were before, and so that was a blessing. But just keep praying for this thing. Let's get it settled out and taken care of. And uh, we have some uh, special requests down there. They have extra, uh, they've been extra busy there lately, working on numerous special projects at home. Uh, Brother Aaron says, we rearranged, redecorated the chapel building, worked hard on landscaping around the property, and they have, have reorganized various areas of the home and other, other various projects. Perhaps the largest project I've mentioned is the rec room renovation, which used to be the uh, chapel downstairs. Uh, but it's currently underway. We're so thankful for Lighthouse Baptist Church in America's Georgia. They've been a blessing to us traveling to the home as a missions trip for both and, and for both funding and assisting on various mission projects. We're eternally grateful and Lord, uh, for the Lord laying us on their hearts and for them allowing the uh, Lord to use them to, as a blessing to the ministry. Now I have some spoken requests. It says, the Lord's been good to us. Some of our prayer requests are listed below. And somebody just asked about these. I don't know who that was, but uh, here it is. 
uh, the monthly financial support, we thought we were doing really good about the first of last month. seemed like we were really doing good. By the middle of the month, we weren't doing very good. And we're still waiting to see what's going to happen this month. But they need uh, cleaning supplies, paper products, restaur uh, restaurant-grade cookware. That means uh, heavy duty. Uh, why? Because we're working with boys. You know, they're, they're kind of like bull in a china shop most of the time. And, Kind of hard on things. We have a lot of air conditioning uh, system needs down there, and we have uh, needing non-perishable foods and uh, laminate flooring to be. We've got laminate flooring, but we have some that's got to be put in. And then looking for suits and jackets for the boys and hygiene products. Sam's Club, Walmart Club uh, gift cards for general purchase use and and girls' home workers. Uh, boy, I tell you what, if you're going to work at the girls' home or if you're going to work at the boys' home, it's more than a burden. It's got to be a calling. Because these kids, you can only deal with so much of their emotions. The girls are, man, they're, they're tough. Uh, Ashley, when you were down there, did you find the girls very easy to get along with? Yeah, <laughs> like the boys. The boys are wonderful. They get upset, they go out and get a fight, it's over, and they, they go on about life. But anyhow, uh, that's not so, not so with the girls. Man, are they sneaky and devious and all this other stuff. So it takes a calling. But anyhow, be praying for them and, and just keep them on your heart. This is, uh, this is a tough ministry. Because the we got one boy that uh, his he was down there uh, a year or so ago, and, and his dad called up and said, "Look, I'm I'm tired of missing my son. I want him back." And we told him it's, he's not ready to go home. He's just not ready. And uh, they uh, were trying to talk him out of it. So I called him and talked to him for a while. And I said, "Listen, it, it is too early for your son to go home." And I said, "We're making progress. He's doing well. He's learned some things. He's doing great. You need to hang in there a little while longer." He said, "No, nope, bring him home." So he brought him home six months later. He's back with us, and he'd been in trouble and all sorts of other things. He's on probation now and all sorts of things going on, and Dad called again. He said, I want to bring him home. And I talked to him and talked to him, and, and uh, we we're, we're made some progress, and he's going to leave him there. But we got to talking for a while, and he, he, this is a lost man. And, I mean, you know, there's lost people, then there's people that are really, really lost. You know what I mean? They're just rough, rough, rough ends, and they live in a hard, hard life in a hard way, and, and this is that guy. And we're talking about his son. All of a sudden, he just got quiet. And I, and I waited for a few seconds. I said, uh, Alan, did I lose you? Did I, I lose you? And he's, he choked a little bit and coughed. And I said, oh. And he's weeping for his son. Just because a man's lost doesn't mean he doesn't love his children, not able to love his children, hurt for his children, uh, being stretched of imagination. He loves his son. And he wants him made better and uh, convinced him to, to leave him with us. And we're going to see if we can't do some great things with him. But I, I have great hopes for him. I was telling our, our attorney they called from uh, uh, wherever it is they are, uh, insurance company attorney. And I was talking to her and I said, uh, the problem's not the kids. They're not that hard to fix. It takes takes a little while, but I said, they're fixable. But I said, the problem's the parents. I said, that's where all this, this lies with. Uh, I said, if... If you really know who, want to know who needs to be sued, it's the parents need to be sued for malpractice because they're not doing the job right and they're sending a bunch of kids out into the world that are a disaster and broken and needing help. So anyhow, be praying for the home. It is a tough, tough ministry. I appreciate the rushes. I appreciate the, the patents and all that they're doing down there. And God's just blessing. I saw where uh, um, Abigail had a birthday and Tyler's having a birthday. Tyler's <laughs> is a case. I, I enjoy being around Tyler. All right, and then uh, go, a couple things. Now, we, we don't have this on here, but something we ought to add is uh, uh, on our prayer request sheet is a place for uh, newly wedded people. We've got a couple newly weds over there. Uh, they called their honeymoon short and they came to church. I really appreciate your dedication, and, boy, that's just, I'm proud of you, just so proud of you. And that was a nice wedding, too. God bless you. Yes, sir? Yeah, grace and wisdom be the place to put them. Yeah, amen, amen. Got a couple things here. Beverly Wheeling is still not doing well. She's, I think, she's still in the hospital. I couldn't quite uh, get the gist of this. They, he, they've taken her for all these tests and everything. Can't find anything wrong with her, but she continues to have a fever and uh, some uh, wheezing and stuff in her lungs. But they say, oh, there's nothing wrong with you. And so, uh, be praying for her. Then Jan Smith, uh, she did break her foot, and she can't be on it for two months. And I mean nothing. You can't put any weight on this for two months. So that's that's a real mess. So uh, that's tough. And Darlene Ennis, they think she had, uh, this is Rachel's mother, uh, they believe she had a uh, small stroke and they think a big stroke may be on the way. So anyhow, 
uh, be praying for them. Patricia Wilkerson, how's she doing? Good. Praise the Lord. All right. This is uh, Shirley and Ralph's daughter. And she's in Mississippi also. All righty. And then Bob Gibson over under Grace. Uh, Bob is is uh, going to be going home to the Lord real, real soon. And is just kind of having a challenge getting there for right now. Uh, but he's... He's running his race, and he's just waiting for the Lord to call him home. He's at the, the hospital. He's, uh, he's uh, unconscious, unaware of what's really going on. So he'll be going home, I expect, pretty soon. So be praying for the family. This is Debbie Kelly's dad. Be praying that the family will have grace and mercy on this thing. And the Brown family uh, for wisdom. And that's all the things I want to speak about right now. Do you have anything you want to add to this today? Yes, ma'am. Miss Beth. Okay. Ralph Fultz, this is Corey's stepdad. This is the guy that makes being a grandpa tough because you can't hardly compete with him. All the grandkids have their own four wheelers. They all have their own rifles. They have all their own. Has he given uh, Callie a pistol yet? Not yet. Well, uh, they just. I mean, this is the greatest grandpa in the world. He knows how to have fun, and he really enjoys his kids, so his grandkids. So really, just be praying for him if you would. All right, anybody else? Yes, sir? Okay, we'll be praying for David. Pray for mom and dad also. Amen. Takes a lot of wisdom. Yes. <laughs> okay, put Bella. All right, Bella under wisdom, and uh, Beth and Corey under grace. Yeah, yeah. I just am amazed how fast this has gone. Seeing her grow up and be headed to college soon. That's exciting. Now we get to see how good a job you did. <laughs> oh, she's going to do great. Amen. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Ashley Schultz, under unspoken. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Okay, Brother Pringer still needs a job. Okay, Eva Black. <laughs> oh, bless her heart. Well, bless her heart. All right. All right, anybody else? Yes, sir? Okay, I like them. Right. 
Amen. Well, good. All right. Well, we hope that you can hear better now. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. What's his name again? Roy Adams, stroke and heart attack. Okay. Oh. Okay, yeah, the camp out. Don't forget to be praying for the camp out. The kids will be safe and have a good time. They'll have a good time. I just want them to be safe and no problems or issues or anything. Uh, also, let's uh, be praying for the Spoon Morse. His nephew, Benny Roy, passed away. And uh, I thought I was going to end up doing that funeral, but because he's in a nursing home, somebody else already made up all the, the plans and everything's going to be no, uh, uh, the, uh, it's going to be, for, the funeral's going to be from five to six, that's it, and in and out and done, and, and so if anybody's interested in, in running down there for that, get a hold of Brother Spoonmore, because he didn't tell me where it's going to be, it's in Greencastle, I'm sure, but uh, Benny got uh, saved uh, a few years ago, Brother Spoonmore thought it was going to be really hard to win him to Christ, he's really nervous about it, but he had been praying a lot, a lot, a lot, and went down there, and it was just like picking a peach off a tree. He was he was ready to be saved, so that's a real blessing. So anyhow, that's going on also. All right, Brother Scott, why don't you, oh, yes, sorry. The buses, okay, there's something I should tell you. Uh, the uh, little bus is going to be, is being fixed, and uh, air conditioning went, went out on it, and the, we got to fix the window on the driver's door, so it'll go down, up, and down. But without the air conditioning, that was like a little toaster running down the road. But they figured out what's wrong with it. It's going to cost us fourteen hundred dollars. Yeah, uh, but it's you know it's it's a bus, and you can't repair it or replace it for that. And so I, you know there's fix it. That's all you can say to them. So they're going to do that, and hopefully they'll get it done here real soon. Yes. Yeah, and they all go down. That's right. Amen. So that's. Uh, that's kind of a kick in the stomach, but those uh, that bus does a lot of work, and it takes care of a lot of things, so uh, it's cheap fix, really. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yep, ma'am. Amen. They know our bus. Praise the Lord. Amen. Anybody else? Our right, brother Scott wants to do some prayer, please. Yes.
Amen. 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 Our Father, we sure thank you and praise you for our liberties and our freedoms. I thank you for this place. And Lord God, we thank you for the Word of God, its power and its, and its wonder and the wisdom we gain from the knowledge we gain from. We thank you for the time to be here tonight. And Lord God, I do thank you for our people. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're the God who's there during bereavement. I think of Bob Gibson. He's on his uh, deathbed. He's headed your way real soon whenever you say it's time. And Lord, I pray that you bless him, and I pray that you give him a safe and gentle crossing. I pray that you bless his, his wife and his children. Lord, watch over them and help them and encourage them in a mighty way. And I thank you, Father, that you're uh, with folks that are, uh, that are in their suffering. I think of this uh, Roy Adams. I don't know whether he's saved or not, but I sure wish he were. And if he's not, I pray somebody to get the gospel to him. And I pray that you'd uh, make a great difference in his life. Having a heart attack and a stroke at the same time is pretty debilitating. I pray, God, you'd be merciful there. I pray for Eva Black that you'd heal her and help her and strengthen her. I think of uh, Miss Beverly and Jan Smith and Darlene and Patricia. Lord, I pray that you'd put your hand upon them. God, I pray that you'd show them thy great and mighty power. And I pray that you'd bless their families. I pray that you'd watch over them. I ask for uh, Brother Dave Smith that you'd help him as he's working with taking care of the house and everything that's going on, plus taking care of his wife. I pray that you'd give grace and mercy to him. And, Lord, I do pray for all of our uh, ministries around here. I pray for our nursery workers. Uh, they just kind of come to my mind. I really appreciate all that they do, and I pray God you bless them, and we're going to be in need of some more before too long, and I, I pray that you'd work that out. But I pray that you just bless our church, help it to grow and to prosper, and help us to make a difference in somebody's life this week, each one of us. pray for Brother Pringer that you'd help him find the right job, and I pray for Ralph uh, Fultz, Lord. I pray that you'd be merciful to him and help him and strengthen him and encourage him and meet his needs and bless him as only you can and walk with him and guide him. And Father, I pray for the Brown family that you'd bless them as for David, to God, it's tough, to, tough growing up, and he's had more than his share of challenges. And I pray that you be merciful to him, help him, help him get a hold of the right and the truth, and help him do right. I pray for Ashley Schultz. I pray that you bless that family in a mighty way. I pray that you bless her on spoken, some work in their lives. I thank you for taking care of so many things in their lives, little details that you're working out. I pray that you bless them in a mighty way. I ask for Bella. Lord God, it's exciting to see her graduating, exciting to see her going off to college. And I pray, Father, that you fill her with the power of the Holy Spirit. Help her. She takes her calculus test tonight. I pray that you bless with that. And I pray, Father, that you'd, you'd help uh, Corey and Beth as she, they're working with her. And, and uh, Lord, this is exciting. You know, I've been to in classes where it seemed like the teacher wanted you to fail, and they they fought you on every step of the way. And then I've had classes where the teacher is all about getting you to succeed. And that's the way Beth and Corey are. They they want their their students to win. They want them to succeed, and uh, they make them learn the, the right way to do things. They teach them and work with them. And Father God, I thank you for them. I pray God you bless them, give them strength and grace and courage and power. And I pray for the Spoonmores tonight. I ask that your hand be upon them. Do you be merciful to them? Thank you for them. I pray for uh, them at this funeral coming up. I pray for mercy and for grace. And I pray that your hand just be with them now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's uh, open up our Bibles to the book of Proverbs, chapter 24. We have been studying the book of Proverbs since we started the church 23 years ago. So we're doing a little over a chapter a year, it looks like. And it's been taking a while. We don't stick just right in Proverbs. We shift gears every once in a while. Tonight we're going to be looking at uh, verses 30 through 34. We're going to finish up this chapter. 
the Bible says down here in Proverbs 29, verse 30. No, that's not right. Yeah, it is. Right? I'm looking wrong. Uh, it says, uh, hmm. I can't read tonight. I have a legitimate excuse. My air conditioning was off all day, and my office is upstairs and runs about 90, 94 degrees when it's hot out. And so my brain is French fried a little bit. But it's chapter, what, 24? There you go. Now we're right. Verse 30. I went by the field, this is Solomon speaking, of course. I went by the field of the slothful, and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. Lo, is all grown over with thorns, and nettles covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, and so shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, or traveleth, I'm sorry, one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. We're looking in the book of Proverbs, and of course this is, uh, we, let's go back to the chapter 1. I want to remind us what we're looking at, what this is all about here. Solomon's speaking to his son. He's in, in trying to, to get through his mind, get through that little eighth inch, quarter inch of cranium and get into his mind and put some things in there and get into his heart and help him to learn. It says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. That's what our young people need. That's what our, all of our people need, is to know wisdom and instruction and perceive words of understanding. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. To give subtility to the simple and the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and interpretation the words of the wise and their dark sayings. He says, so what I'm trying to do, son, I'm trying to teach you some wisdom. I'm trying to get some things in your mind so that you will be wise and that you'll be able to make wise and right choices in life. And so over here in chapter 24, uh, he's talking about, uh, he, he said, now then, we've uh, uh, we've seen the, what's going on here. We, I've gone down by the, the slothful man's house. I've seen what he's doing. He's not doing anything. And his, vineyard, and his vineyard's overrun, and there's got thorns and nettles and weeds and junk everywhere, and it's just falling in on itself. The walls are falling down. Everything's a mess. But he said, I looked and received instruction, a little sleep. They get a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding the hands to sleep. And so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and I want as an armed man. Now, I'm thinking about this verse, these verses, I'm thinking, that's just not really the way the whole chapter started. And how does this tie in? So I went back to chapter 24, verse 1 through 3. It says, he's speaking to his son again. It says, Be not thou envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them, for their heart studieth destruction, and their lips talk of mischief. Mischief, therefore, or th through wisdom, oh, I'm sorry, through wisdom is a house builded, and by understanding is it established. In chapter 24, he's talking about building your house. And we talked about this earlier. Uh, a couple, several weeks ago now, but uh, building the house, or building not just a building, but building the family, building everything, raising your children, doing all the things right that you're supposed to do. It's a challenge. The word house there is from a word meaning to, of course, to build, to begin, to, uh, or it also means to obtain children. So it's an interesting uh, prospect here. We're looking at uh, Solomon. He's talking to his son. He said, now look, I want you to, to take some instruction. I've been, uh, uh, we're going to talk about the fellow here who is, who is slothful. And he's not done a very good job taking care of his property, but that's not really what I'm interested in. I want you to understand what's important in life. Your house is important, your property is important, uh, but there's more to it, and your family is more important. To understand these verses, we have to look at the practical sense. He said, I've, I've gone by here and I've looked at things, I've, I've considered, I've thought about it, and I've, I've seen the mess this guy's made because he's lazy. He's just sinking lazy. He will not do what he can do when he could do and when he should do it. And there's, there's times in people's lives when you can't get everything done that you want to do, but you're working and trying to get the necessary things done. That's one thing. But to just say, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to let the house cave in, the property cave in. That's a whole other thing. And this is what he's talking about. The person who just says, no, I'm just tired. I just need to, I need to rest some more. And that's really the basic, you know, you look at this, it's a very basic uh, thought thing, uh, thought process here. You look at it and you say, okay, there's not much going on in this guy's life doesn't have a plan, doesn't have a heart for it, he's give up on things. Maybe he's a drunkard. And maybe his drink has taken him away. Maybe he's an alcohol, or a, a drug addict, and maybe his uh, drink and, and his drugs are taken away, or maybe he's got some other uh, moral challenges going on, and he just doesn't care anymore. Well, it's a form of sloth. 
God's telling his, his son, or Solomon's telling his son, he said, look, don't be envious of evil men. It looks like they're having a good time all the time. Don't desire to be with them. they got a problem going on. Their heart studieth destruction, and their lips talk of mischief. But through wisdom is a house built. You need to be wise. If you're going to be wise in this life, if you're going to get things accomplished and done, you have to have some wisdom. If you've got to have a plan for your home, you've got to have a plan for your future. Now, to understand these verses, of course, these, this is their practical sense, but I'm going to shift gears here. I'm going to go over to a spiritual application on all of this. Uh, my mind uh, stays pretty close to young people. I love kids. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly when I was introduced to uh, Lester Roloff and the children's home ministry down in Corpus Christi. Uh, but I heard what he was doing. I heard, heard him preach. He won my heart. And I wanted to work for him uh, when I got out of college. But the Lord said, no, you're not going to Corpus. You're going to go to Florida instead. So we ended up down there. But I've always had a heart for young people and for children's homes. And then lo and behold, a few years ago, God gave us a children's home. Actually, he gave us two of them. And uh, it was a, well, I'll tell you what. If he had done this 20 years ago, I would have been on a uh, uh, jet getting down there. I just got out of there as fast as I could and got down there and been there working. But that wasn't God's plan. And he held things back, but I prayed for the roll-off homes. I've been involved with them and different things all these years and because I love kids. I look at young people, my heart breaks for them. I drive down by Jeff High School and see the kids coming out of school and see the kids going into school. And some of them look, look fine and upright and moral and decent and everything. And I see the kids on the other side of the street. Uh, the castaway kids, the ones who are, or the the druggies, the ones who are the, walking with the, uh, in goth. They look like a black Sabbath all over them. They just they're a mess. They're a disaster. They're, my heart breaks for them. I see the girls walking down the, the street and they're painted up like hussies. We used to, I used to have a, a bus I drove for the school corporation and picked up kids and I talked to them and, and witnessed to them and get them into church and stuff. And had this one little old girl come in one time and she was a, uh, she was a mess. She was uh, 15 going on 25. And, and she was, she, some of these little old girls know more about uh, sex and immorality than 40-year-old barfly. They know more about uh, things that they shouldn't have any business be involved in, but they've, they've had it all their life. She got, she got to where she's coming out on the bus early. And she'd get out of school early, and I'd be sitting there waiting, and she'd come in and talk to me, and I'd, I talked to her and pick on her and tease her and, and talk to her about coming to church and stuff. And one time she got on the bus behind me and was talking to me and she put her hand on my shoulder. I said, get your hand off of me. Man, she jumped about halfway back to the back of the bus. And I said, don't you ever, ever touch me again. Well, I set up a really good line and from that point on, this was no longer uh, uh, some, something was convoluted in her mind. Uh, she found out that here's a, here's a person she could probably trust and she's willing to talk to. So we started talking to her a little more and more. I got the bus go by. We picked her up, brought her to church. She got saved. She went to camp. She got saved. I'll tell you what happened at camp. Uh, we had, man, Brother Tom had preached tremendous and it just ripped the, the, uh, the wool right off of people's eyes. They were seeing stark right into eternity. And this little girl was tore up and I sat down beside her and I said, let me tell you something about your life. I said, uh, when you were a little girl, some man came into your life and he started messing with you and he molested you and he stole your purity and your decency from you. And her jaw just about hit the ground. And she said, ah, 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 and then she just all came out. And it was a, it was, she was living in a duplex. Her, mom, her and her mom were living in a duplex and she stayed uh, home during the day in the summertime. Mom went to work and the next door neighbor guy started messing with her and just wrecked and ruined her. And I got to, got to, not only did we get to win her to the Lord, I started talking to her about her life and what God wanted to do for her and how God wanted to help her. And there's something about these kids when they're so broken and they have all this mess going on in their life. It just, it thrills my soul to see God working in their life. Now, I love seeing anybody get saved. I, just, I really tell me to death. I don't care whether it's a kid down in junior church. I don't care whether it's a, it's a uh, person in the nursing home or anywhere in between. I love seeing people saved. But when I see somebody that their life has been wrecked and ruined, uh, by others, and they've been used and abused, and I see them give their heart to Christ. I'm so so excited because God's going to give them, if they'll they'll stick it out, they'll do right. God will give them a new life, a new chance. The Bible says we're a new creature in Christ Jesus. So the here's the the uh, 
spiritual application, the, the wise man, he looks at, over at the, the field of the slothful, the vineyard of the man void of understanding, and he sees somebody that, that's allowed his family to get, get involved, in, involved in things. Maybe he don't care about them, or maybe he can't care. He's too busy with his own mess in his own life. But the children that have come into his life, the wife that he has, or maybe the, her husband or whatever, they just don't care about the things that are important to him, and the whole world is falling down around them. Uh, the Bible says in, in Proverbs 29, 15, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. And that's what we get down there at the children's home in Mississippi. We get boys right now. We work getting girls uh, that they've been left to themselves. They let the, let the school raise let the preschool raise them, let the school raise them, let everybody else raise them. I don't have time for them. I, I can't be bothered. Don't bug me because I've got things to do and the kids can take care of themselves and the kids do take care of themselves and they wreck and ruin their lives. Uh, we've had girls down there that just would absolutely break your heart to know the things that they've done. We've got boys down there. I just shake my head at things that have been perpetrated against them and been done to these these boys. Now these kids, they were just they were just perfectly innocent kids at one time, but now their life's a disaster. We're trying to put them all back together. And we look at this thing, and I, I think, how does this happen? I was talking to a lawyer this week, and uh, well, I just told you, I told him fixing the kids is not that hard. It's fixing the parents, fixing the home. Uh, somehow we have to have it set up to where the, we can get the parents to come down to the home and spend two weeks down there at the home where else we have, some, have to figure out some way to have an ongoing uh, Bible training, Bible institute or something that the parents can do online so they can see some things that, that will help them parent better and fix the home because the home is the problem. Why? Because nettles have overgrown the thing and thorns have taken over and the walls fallen down and not every nasty thing in the world can get into the house because there's nothing to stop it from getting in there. And this, the wise man goes by and he looks at this and he says the, the, the vineyard is lawful, the, the vineyard and, the, and his field, they're just wiped out, they're, they're a mess. And he has a, that's his observation, he said this whole thing is a wreck. And you look at some of these families, you say they're just a wreck. We see the, the parents come down and they bring their kid down and they try to put on their, their best show for us. They try to show us how wonderful they are, they, how good they are, and how gracious and kind they are. And they are this, the best parents in the world. And we're not sure why little Johnny's doing what he's doing. We're not sure why our daughter's being the way she's being. Uh, but uh, you can see on the kid's face, they're just anger all over them. There's this wrath that's deep down inside them. They're wanting to lash out at everything and everybody. They hate being brought down here. Little Miss uh, Running Shoes, when her mom and dad brought her down there, they told her that we're going to take you out. We're going to get you a new dog. And they drove two states to bring her over to the home and drop her off. And they finally told her, well, we're dropping you off here because you're going to go to the children's home. Well, man, she hit the road running. And John was following her in the van. And uh, just she's on her way to Philadelphia. She didn't know where she's going, but she wasn't going to be at the home until the police officer convinced her, you're going back to the home. But parents, uh, they lied to her. Just flat lied. They didn't sit down and say, honey, we got some problems. You're gonna, your life is going to be upside down. It's going to be a wreck. It's going to be a disaster if we don't get you some help. So we're going to take some drastic action here, and we're getting you some help. And no, you're not going to run away. And no, you're not going to kill yourself. You're going to get some help. You're going to get made better. But we're bringing some, some people in to help us. But no, they won't lie to her again after they've lied to her all the times in her life. And she comes in, and she gets things squared away, and she gets things right, and uh, she starts growing. But the parents, they pretend like they're so perfect. We've done everything we possibly can. We're the best parents in the whole wide world. Well, good housekeeping would nominate us for a award right now if there just was an award to be awarded. And you can say all that you want, and, and play that game if you want, but we're going to know your kids. I like watching kids. I like talking to the kids. Uh, your kids come in. Do you know your kids will tell me anything they want to know? They'll tell the Sunday school teachers anything in the world. That's just It's wonderful. And you want to know what's going on in somebody's life? Get their kids down there and talk to them and just ask them things. And they'll tell you everything. They'll tell you a lot of stuff you don't want to know and things you weren't even asking for. And say, Mommy and Daddy had a big fight on the way to church today. Boy, it was bad. They were screaming hollering in the car and everything. And I thought they were going to get in a fist fight. Really? Oh, yeah. Now, how much of it is really accurate, I don't know. But I know what's going on a lot of times, so the Sunday school teachers. Well, here's the objection. The observation is the slothful man has made, made a mess of things. His home's a wreck, his children are a wreck, his family's a wreck, his life is a wreck. Now, here's the objection. The objection is he's allowed, he's allowed these things to happen. A son or a daughter whose face is covered with the, all the nettles and and the thorns of life, a wife who has been beat down and run over and, and uh, pounded so many times, and I don't mean physically pounded, but verbally abused and, and everything so many times, she can't stand it anymore. She, she's lashing out, she's giving it back, and she's 
venomous and she's angry and she's mad all the time because the husband can't say anything kind to her. Fellas, i got news for you. Uh, you've lost your mind if you're not going to be nice to your wife. It's so much fun to be sweet to your wife and watch her. You say, well, I tried that a long time ago. Keep trying. Keep doing it because she can only take it for so long and you're going to reap what you sow. Be nice to her. And be sweet to her and be kind to her. Scared to death. Bring her flowers sometimes. And just get her some candy or something. Say, oh, I'm, I'm fat. I don't need any of this candy. I'll share it with you. Okay. And you sit down and you have some chocolate-covered caramels or something together. And so have a heart attack together or whatever. But women like chocolate and they like talking. They like to communicate. And if you don't have time to say nice things to your wife, if you don't have time to love on your wife, you're doing despite the spirit of grace. God has blessed you and given you a home. Ladies, you don't know how to take care of your husband. I love your husband. The husband, I, I'm going to tell you something about men. Men all have an ego. It's fragile as an egg. And you can say things that will destroy your husband or you can say things that will build him up. And your husband needs a cheerleader. He needs somebody to build him up and encourage him and to tell him, hey, honey, you go get him. You can get it done. Go do it. I'm proud of you. I'm trusting you. I know you can make things happen. And just brag on him for things. And he will eat it up and he'll treat you nice back. But the 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 sloth man, he's not going to do that. Sloth wife, she's not going to do that. The objection is all these thorns and nettles are starting to cover everything. We've lost our joy. We've lost our peace. We've lost our happiness. It's a horrible thing. The defenses, the stone wall, the Bible says, the stone wall there was broken down. The defenses of life that should have been in place from infancy, uh, the proper care the, from... Uh, the proper watchfulness, the proper weeding uh, out of the intruders of life, the trimming of the deadwood, the proper fertilizing, the defending against uh, those coming into the vineyard who should not be in there. It's not being done because it's, just, it's too far gone. So we can't fix anything. It's all destroyed. The Bible says that the foundations be destroyed. What can the righteous do? i tell you what they do. They've got to go back and rebuild the foundation. That's a hard job. But you have to do it. Well, there's an there's a uh, observation. He sees what the mess is. His objection is it's a mess. The walls falling down. There's, you know, everything's falling apart. And then there's here's uh, I guess here's the uh, occurrence. Here's something that we can. You say, well, preacher, is there a picture in the Bible? Well, there is. God's so sweet. He's so so good. Uh, he doesn't hide things. He doesn't have his favorites. He said, oh, uh, brother Brown's my favorite. We're not going to say anything ne negative about him. Uh, we'll just kind of hide his bad things that he's done, his foolishness that he's done in this life. God doesn't do that with the people in the Bible. There's a lot of things he does cover, I'm sure, but with David, everything is open and put out there for us. In uh, David chapter, or David, <laughs> Samuel chapter two, 12, verse 1 and 2, the Lord sent, uh, I'm going to get ahead of myself. Let's just go over here to uh, 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. Yep, chapter 12, okay. Yep, and the Lord's... Nah, that's not where I want. I don't want to start with Nathan coming to him. I want to back up. It must be chapter 11. I got the wrong one there. Yeah, there it is. It came to pass after the year was expired at the time when the kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab, his servants, and his servants with him, and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Amnon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. Interesting word there, tarried. He rested. He waited. He inclined. He, he reclined, I'm sorry. He took, his, he took a break. It, what's the Bible say? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding the hands to sleep. And so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth. David stayed behind. And you know the story. This is a horrible thing. He was... Didn't have anything to do. All his generals were gone. All his friends were gone. Everybody's out working. His kids are out in the war. Everybody's gone except him. He's hanging around the, the castle. He gets out. He's walking in the evening. The Bible says he's walking in the evening. He looks across there. There's a woman washing herself. And he says, my goodness, who is that? And he sends for her and takes her. And you know what happens. And she, she is uh, pregnant. And so he ends up having Uriah, her husband, killed. And then he takes her and marries her and he thinks everything's hidden, but nothing's hidden from God. And nothing's hidden from anybody else. God lets things be seen and known. And so finally about a year later, David, after this baby is born and it dies and everything, David gets a visitor. He gets a preacher come to him. And Nathan the prophet came to him and talked to him and told him uh, everything that he's done is known and everything he's done is going to be taken, uh, taken account of. 
And uh, Nathan said to David, he said, he gave him a story. And the story pointed to a man being wicked and ungodly and unrighteous. And David got mad at this guy. And the, the preacher said, Thou art the man. He said, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I moreover would have given thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? And thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Amnon. Now, you have to understand that David is guilty on two counts of... Uh, of a of a crime of two different crimes that would put him to death. He murdered a guy, and then he uh, stole another guy's wife and had relations with her and all this other mess. He can and he had a conspiracy to kill a man. He said, Now therefore, God says, Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thy house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun, for thou didst this, this, this secretly, but I'll do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. His home was grown over with thorns and nettles covered the face there and the wall was broken down and now it's a mess. Why? He said, I'm going to stay home and I'm just going to rest. He's a young man, still, he's still a young king. He had a lot of, uh, before him, he had a war before him, he should have gone out and fought, but no, he stayed home. And he just rested when he should have been out there working and doing something. He didn't put his hand to the plow, he didn't work like he should have, didn't go where he's supposed to go and do what he's supposed to do. And now then, God's going to start taking things away from him. 2 Samuel chapter 13, the Bible says that, uh, talking about his son Amnon. Amnon calls for a, uh, he, he's, he's sick, he, he, he just loves sick. Yeah, have you ever seen these teenagers? Oh boy, God bless you, your boy's a teenager now. I'm thinking about Ben, he's a teenager now, and, and some of these other kids. And one of these days, some little girl's going to wink at him or smile at him, and their knees are going to go like water, and they're going to be a mess, and they're just not going to know how to talk to them or whatever. They don't need to. They're only 15, 16 years old. They don't need a girlfriend. What are they going to do with them? You know, you can't keep them. can't bring them home. What are you going to do with them? Leave them alone. That's what you do with them. Stay away from them. They're bad, 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 bad. Whiskey's bad, and women are evil. That's what you got to teach your children. But anyhow, this girl, his, his stepsister, Somehow he got enamored with her and he said, I, I just I can't stand it if I can't have her. Well, he had a friend, John Dab. I just told, talked about this last weekend, last weekend. And uh, John Dab said, What's wrong with you? You're the king's son. You got everything going on. Why are you so lean? Why are you so sad faced? Why are you mooning around like a lost puppy? What's wrong with you? He says, Ah, oh, it's, it's Tamar, my, my stepsister. I'm in love with her and I don't know what to do about it. He said, Well, I'll tell you what to do. And he came up with a plan. He showed him a plan how to get her to come over. And then she got into his house and he raped her. Oh man. Oh man, oh man, oh man. When David heard about this, the Bible said that he was very wroth. Well, what did he do? Nothing. Not a thing. Not long after that, Absalom, Timar's sister, or Timar's brother, I'm sorry had a plan. And I think in that plan, he planned on killing his dad, and he planned on kill, killing Amnon. But he had all his brothers there, and all the family there, except David. David wouldn't go. And he killed Amnon. And so all of a sudden, David's lost a baby that wasn't, didn't come to, when, when the baby was born, it died. as Bathsheba's baby. Now his granddaughter has been, is this his granddaughter? It would be his daughter. His daughter's been raped. Now then his son has been murdered. And now then Absalom's running for his life. The Bible says David longed to go forth unto Absalom, Absalom for he's con con comforted concerning Amnon, seeing he was dead. And then Absalom got to come home, and then he led a rebellion and tried to kill his own father. And then got through that, and, his, and that son died. Now he's lost another boy, and then when he's just about on his deathbed, and just about right when uh, uh, 
Solomon's going to take over the kingdom. Another son raises himself up, Adoniah, and he decides he's going to take over the kingdom. His dad's not even dead yet, but he's going to take it over. And he gets the, the whole crowd with him. He gets this thing going for it, and he's going to take over from his dad, and he's going to become king. And, and finally it all works out, and no, he doesn't get that. And it ends up that his, that son also dies. David, why did this all happen to you? Well, I'll tell you why. I just, I, I just I didn't take care of things at home. I didn't watch over my children. I didn't watch over my, my family. I didn't do the things I was supposed to do. I, I just decided to rest a little bit. I decided to kick back. I can deal with this later. Several years ago, when we were living down in Florida, Monty Booker uh, was my good friend. And he had five children. We had five children. People with five kids don't have a whole lot of families to run around with. Because who wants to have a family with five kids come over to your house for a uh, hot dog cookout. You eat all their hot dogs and drink all their iced tea, and it's a big challenge. So the Bookers and the Murdochs went out all the time, horse ran together, ran together, had a good time. Monty Booker was uh, doing his best, uh, putting his family together, and making things work with them, and they were singing gospel. And man, they they had a they had a melody or they had a harmony that was just absolutely beautiful, and they had the the power of God on their lives. Clean living family, right living family. Uh, they loved the Lord. They, they one of the things about singing. You can learn every note, and you can hit every single note. You can have the music down absolutely perfect, and you can get up and sing and have the absolute most perfect voice, and it'll ring hollow in the church if you don't have the power of God on your life. And how do you get the power of God? Clean living and prayer. I saw those girls get up, and, and Steve would be singing with them, but four girls and Steve, and uh, the girls would sing, and uh, the Holy Ghost would just move on the on the service. Uh, there at the school down in Lockheed uh, Baptist Church, the school, Christian school down there, they had a large, large Christian school. And uh, they got up one, one Sunday for, or Friday for chapel, and Diane sang, One Day the Party Will Be Over. And man, that's a powerful song, but these girls had the life that backed up that song. And revival broke out in the school. School was over for the rest of the day. The kids were at the altar all all afternoon, they had people coming out. The, the teachers had to be brought back in. Different people had to be brought in to deal with the kids. And sin was getting right. It was, it was glorious. It was wonderful. It was powerful. I was with Monty one time. We were coming back to his, his house, and they were in 4-H. The kids were in 4-H. So they raised show cattle and stuff. And, and uh, it had been a long, long day. They'd been out uh, building fence, and we rolled back into the into the driveway. And Monty's a big fellow. He's 6'4", 6'5". 400 pounds plus. He's just a big, big man. And he's had a hard day, a long day. He pulls in, and he's just ready to go in, sit down, and drink some iced tea. He is wore out. Pulls up in there, and he looks over, and he sees the show cattle sitting out there, the calves out there, and they need to be worked. And I saw him looking at him. I saw him look ahead, and he just leaned back and shut his eyes and sighed real deep. And I sat there, and I thought, he's deciding what he's going to do right now. And I just was quiet and watching. I didn't know what he's going to do. He took a deep breath and opened the door and got out and hollered for the kids. He said, okay, let's work these cattle. And so over the next hour and a half, they're out there working show cattle. What was he doing? He's being diligent with what was precious to him, what was important with his house. The nettles weren't going to grow up. Now, I'll be honest, uh, uh, Monty's yard was not always mowed the best, and it always wasn't most kept up because he put other things first. He put church first, he put God first, he put his family next. He did the things he's supposed to do, and the house and the property came in later somewhere along the line, but he taught his kids to be diligent. David didn't do that. He said, I'm tired. I need a break. I'm going to stay here and rest a little bit. We've fought so many battles. We've won so many battles. Nobody's going to beat us. I'll just let Joab go handle it. I'm just going to stay and rest while you all go out to war. Well, there's an obituary on here also. There's an observation, and there's an objection. There's an occurrence, and we use David for a picture. Then there's an obituary. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that tra traveleth, and thy want is an armed man. His poverty? David, what'd you lose in life? You realize David was a multimillionaire when he died. He had gold in abundance that he gave to the 
uh, building of the temple. He had silver in abundance. He had iron in abundance. He, he was literally a millionaire by anybody's standards. He was very, very wealthy, wealthy king. David, are you a wealthy king? No, I've lost it all. What do you mean? Well, come out here. I'll show you something. See this spot right here? This is where I lost my honor because I, I was up here on the roof and I looked over there and I saw a woman that was not my wife. And I had impure thoughts and wrong thoughts and I took her and brought her home to me and I did that which should never be done and it started a, a snowball rolling and has ruined my life. I lost my honor that day. I stole her honor that day. And then she had a baby, my baby, and that baby died. And then her husband, who is a faithful, faithful servant to me, he's a faithful warrior, he's a man that I could trust with my very life, he had my back all the time, I had him killed. I dropped into the depths of degradation. And I was a wicked, ungodly, unrighteous man, and God brought it back to me. My son Amnon, that little boy that I held in my arms, that I loved, that I rocked, that I patted his head, and I talked to him, I didn't do right by him, and I lost him. He raped his own sister. And then his own brother murdered him. And then poor old Tamar, she had to live in obscurity all of her life because she was so, so shattered by what happened. I couldn't help her. I couldn't fix her. And then Absalom, <laughs> I lost Absalom's love and respect. And he wanted to murder me. He wanted to kill me along with Ammon and didn't get it done. He came back and led a rebellion and split the whole, whole nation. We had death and destruction on all sides all around us until finally my son was killed in battle on purpose. He was executed in battle. I lost another son. And then before I, right before I died, my other son, Adonijah, rose up against me and rose up to take the throne away from Solomon, whom I'd already promised the kingdom to. And he tried to wreck the, the kingdom and ruin things. He said, I've lost everything. My children, I don't know if I'll see my kids in heaven. I don't know if I'll see these people ever again. My heart is broken. I feel as I'm poor as I can be. Why, David? Why did this happen? Because I got lazy raising that which is most important to me. Not talking about raising up a kingdom, not talking about raising up a palace, not talking about raising up an army, but raising up a family, raising up a home, and raising up a place that's right. And now that he's telling his son Solomon all these things, he's saying, now look, son, I want you to be wise on something. I want you to be wise. I want you to go down here, and I want you to look at these, these poor people down here, the way they do things, and take some instruction. So Solomon takes his walk, and he gets some instruction, and he comes back when he's an older man, and he's got his own son. He says, look, son, I'm going to tell you something. I want you to understand something. I don't want you to be lazy. I want you to go out there and do what you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to do. Good. Stand for what's right, but I want you to build your house, and not just your physical house, but I want you to build your family. And I want you not to waste your time sleeping and goofing off and doing nothing. Your children take time. If you're not going to spend time with them, then you're going to have a mess on your hands. And if you don't believe me, just look at Grandpa's life. Grandpa David lost everything. It was important. You say, well, preacher, does that go on today? It goes on every day. It goes on every stinking day. I don't know what's happened here recently, but it seems like the gate's been kicked open and everybody's gone a little bit nuts. And they're doing crazy things. They're doing stupid things. They're doing unrighteous things, ungodly, immoral, and wicked things. And I'm thinking, what has happened here? Well, I know what the Bible says. The Bible says the devil know that he hath but a little time. And he is running amok right now. And he's messing up people's homes, he's messing up their lives, he's messing up their futures, and he's messing up their eternity because he's stealing their glory that they're going to have in heaven. Why? Because he, he, he's teaching them to lean back, take it easy, and just sleep for a while, rest for a while, and it'll be okay. And while we're sleeping, while we're resting, our country's burning to the ground. Our nation's a wreck and it's a ruin. Well, folks, this is not a fun part of the message. This is not a fun message to preach. I think mommy and daddy should take some serious time and look at how they're raising their kids and look and see whether the job is more important than the house or the home, the children. See if the career is more important than the house, the home, and the children. See if the, the sports are more important, if, the, if whatever is more important i got news for you. If they are, you need to go back and get things straightened out. So what if church becomes more important? I don't think you can have too much church. I'm a pastor. I'm here all the time. Raise my kids in church. I'm kind of, I'm kind of glad the way most of them have turned out. I, I worry about Beth sometimes. But for the most part, my kids are all right. I love having them here in the church. I love seeing what's going on with them. 
swung in to see Josie today, harassed her just for fun. That's that's a fun thing to go in there, see her and her husband. I'll tell you this, Hugo, uh, you won my heart. I didn't trust you. You're quiet. And you were furtive. Working at Ryan's, we'd come in and you was watching Josie all the time, peeking out the door and looking around the corner because she was so pretty. I thought, what are you looking at my daughter for? He's quiet. I bet you in the, in the 20 years you guys have been married, you haven't said 50 sentences to me. He's just quiet. But Burl and I were talking when we were going over to see you today. Josie really won the prize. She got a fine, fine husband. But you got a fine, fine, fine wife, too. Now, you got some wonderful kids. Don't mess up with your kids. Pay attention to them. Take time with them. I say that to everybody. I say that to the Browns. You guys couldn't have kids. Look what God did for you. You got a house full of children. Isn't it wonderful? It's lovable. It's tremendous. God's been good to you. But don't take your eye off the ball. That's the same thing I say to everybody. Don't take your eye off the ball. We had a wreck. And it cost us dearly. It messed me up bad. And for a good while, I took my eye off the ball. And I didn't watch my kids as close as I should. And it cost my kids. Some of them more than others. Thorns came up and thistles came up and challenges came in. The little walls were breaking down. By the time God got Humpty Dumpty put back together, that's some real challenges to deal with. But God is merciful. And He's kind. And He's loving and He's understanding. And if you say, well, preacher, I've been kind of remiss in things. I haven't done the things I'm supposed to do. I haven't been the kind of dad I'm supposed to be or the mom I'm supposed to be. I've, I've kind of let things go at the house. Well, God will give you time if you just repent and go back to Him and talk to Him and say, I need some help. We you just help and I found that God loves to help His children. He wants to give us wisdom. He wants to give us guidance. He wants to give us instruction. And the Bible says He wants to bring us to an expected end. An end with glory. So how's it going, folks? How's it in your home? How are you doing on your construction? How are you doing on your house? So preacher, I'm retired. I'm, my kids are... You got grandkids? How's it going with your grandkids? Woohoo! Jessica's going to have a baby. That's what I heard. Is that right? When? Is it a little boy? William Burl is a very good name. Just pass that along. Uh, I've been praying for Jessica for a lot of years. Well, I'm looking for him for a church too. God loves your kids. Don't quit praying for your children. Don't quit doing what you're supposed to. Sometimes we can't do much, but we can pray. And sometimes we get so tired, we just don't even want to pray. When you get to that point, pray anyhow. That's the most important time, right then and right there. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you for the day. We thank you for your mercy. Father in God, I thank you that you are soon coming king and warrior. You're coming to clean this mess up and straighten this world out. And Father, my heart is heavy. It's, it grieves for what's going on in our country. It grieves for what's going on in the families. Lord, I, I'll go down there to the home, and, and I tell folks, don't go down there because you'll lose your heart. And that's the truth. You go down there with those boys and, those, and see what's going on in their life and you see the great need and, and what's just... It didn't need to be this way. It didn't have to be this way. But God, we've taken our eyes off the ball too long and our children have, have been hurt. And I see husbands and wives divorcing and husbands and wives falling apart. It's because there, there's challenges and issues and things that have just not been taken care of for so long and trying to fix them now and, and trying to put things back together so hard. But God, you're a God of all grace and all power and of all might, and you're not uh, surprised by any of this, and you know what's going on, and you bring this stuff to the forefront so we can deal with it. And God, I pray that you'd bless us and help us. I pray that you'd bless our church in a mighty way and bless our people in a mighty way. And have mercy upon us and guide us for your glory, oh God, please. Of course, in Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right, if our ushers will come, we'll take up our... Whatever day this is, Wednesday evening, tithes, offerings, and faith promise. Oh, here's a, a blessing. The uh, Lighthouse Baptist Church in Americus, Georgia. Uh, they have fallen in love with the boys' home down there, and the boys and everything. And uh, they heard that the offerings had been down, so they took up a love offering for the home. 
Sunday, and they raised four thousand dollars in one day. And I, I'll tell you what, the the home was we were sweating bullets because we didn't know how we we're going to pay everybody. And God is just, He just merciful. He just merciful. Brother Ralph, would you lead some prayer, please? Blessing you want to share tonight before we go home. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, well, bless the Lord. I was amazed. Every once in a while, you know, I love him to death. There's times he just aggravates me with it. There's times maybe he come across something like that. And just... Amen. <laughs> Amen. Kids are awesome. Miss Shirley? No, this is praise time. Okay, I'll put it on there. Who is Okay. Oh, boy. Stephen Small family. This, this guy was coming on the bus. He'd gotten saved. Got, did he get saved or was saved? He got saved. Things were going the right direction, and this COVID-19 came along, and now their family's busted up and going five different directions. Be praying for the small family. Anybody else? Let's have a praise. Something good going on. Something wonderful. Your dog ate the cat or something. Yes. <laughs> Amen. 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 Somebody else? Yes, sir? Yeah, don't, don't. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, it's Arkansas math. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. All right. Who would ever thunk that? Amen. Her husband's a blessing to her. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Yes, sir? She might get two jobs to keep you at that. <laughs> All right, well, good. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Uh, yes, ma'am. Well, yeah, knock yourself out. Well, praise the Lord. That worked out good.
Amen. And that's in Michigan? Wisconsin. Okay, well, good. Is she moving out of Wisconsin? Oh, there you go. Good for her. Getting out of those winters. Amen. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Yes, he does. Come on, Ralph. God's just good. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? All right. Let's stand. We dismiss in prayer. Brother Jerry, would you mind dismissing us in prayer, please?